This is Star Talk. This is Star Talk. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. I work at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, where I serve as the director of the Hayden Planetarium. And I've got in studio with me Chuck. Chuck Nice. Hey, hey man, welcome back. It's always good to be here, Neil. Uh, you know, we don't have a guest today, so that usually means what? It usually means that we're going to do some cosmic queries. Cosmic queries. These yes. are questions drawn from our, our listenership and all of our social media. That's correct. And I think what happens is that we solicit the questions, and sometimes questions don't fit in any category. Right. As they all just, uh, potpourri. Uh, potpourri. I don't know what that means, but potpourri. It means none of these questions stink. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's, it's Cosmic Queries, Potpourri Edition, where none of the questions stink. <laughs> so I've not seen any of the questions. No, you have not. And Which is not like a test. It's not. No, no yeah, you're not here to stump me, but right. if I don't know the answer, I'm going to tell you. I don't right. know the answer. Okay. Exactly. So right, let's get start right off. And it's very cool. So uh, this is Brian Marood. I'm hoping I'm saying, you know. Why do you have such issues with people's names? You know what? It's What's become up a, with you? It's actually become a thing now. Okay. <laughs> because people now are online. They're just like, I just want to see how Chuck butchers my name. <laughs> I can't wait to see how Mary Chuck... Smith. <laughs> find out. Wait, Mary Smith? <laughs> All right. Anyway, okay. so Brian Marood. I hope, Brian, that's your name. Yeah, this is what Brian says. <clears throat> I've seen a lot of infographics lately about ripples in space-time due to gravity. Mm. Are there any space-time fabric waves caused by the expansion of the universe? Or is the concept of galaxies accelerating away from each other a misnomer in that they're not actually accelerating through space so much as the space between galaxies is getting bitter, bigger at an accelerated rate? This guy's been thinking, man. Yeah. Uh, so that's, he's been thinking. Uh, he's correct. Okay, next question. <laughs> <laughs> I love questions like that. Yeah, there you go, Brian. Uh, the answer is yes. How about that? Yeah, he has a comma 42. Yes. No. <laughs> so uh, the gravitational waves are ripples within the pre-existing fabric of space and time. And you can get these waves if you have galaxies colliding or black holes coalescing. and uh, you, it, Titanic gravitational events in the universe will trigger ripples through the fabric of space-time. And we call those gravity waves. And we, uh, right now we're trying to detect them. The right. Laser Interferometric Gravity Wave Observatory... LIGO. 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 L-I-G-O. You can just L-I-G-O. You can just Google that. Right. And this is our first attempt to detect these gravity waves, first predicted by Albert Einstein. Now, if those gravity waves were interconnecting, would that be Lego LIGO? <laughs> I'm just asking. I'm just saying. Oh like if you could snap them together, <laughs> build yourself a little gravity wave castle. I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> So, uh, so when you're things within the pre-existing space can generate uh, gravity waves, but space itself space expands. Itself yeah, cannot. when that's expanding, I mean, there may be a way, but not by stuff that's in, something outside. Of so, it, 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 so there has to be an event an that event. causes this, right? Because the the gravity field is there all the time. Something has to put a ripple in it, and that ripple moves, by the way, at the speed of light. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I had to put my hand up in front of a camera. There's a camera here now. Oh, people. yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, it's, it makes perfect sense. It's a ripple, just like in a lake or a pond. Exactly. You need something to drop into the water to break the surface tension to yeah. cause the wave. Yeah, and the pond is there with or without the ripple. Right. Now you want to put in a ripple and observe that. Boom. You got it. Bada bing. Bada bing, bada boom. There you go, Brian. The, um... Oh, by the way, we haven't detected a gravity wave yet. This is a oh. very, gravity waves are very weak. Even when they're strong, they're weak. So, <laughs> so uh, these gravity wave detectors are going to detect a disturbance over a given length of space okay. that is uh, about the same magnitude as the width of an atomic nucleus. Really? Yes. <laughs> That's no, insane. It's completely freaking insane. That's insane. It is the, a frontier of technology. The, the, the scientific question is pushing the engineering frontier Absolutely. to make this measurement. And th that's what the, the eye in LIGO, laser, laser Interferometric Gravity Wave Observatory. Right. And we're looking for gravity waves. And if we get good at it, we can detect gravitational disturbances 
arriving from the Big Bang itself. Wow. Ooh. That's pretty cool, actually. Ooh, yeah. Look at that, man. Mm -hmm. That's a, so it's a, it's technology. Well, it's actually it's an answer in search of technology. Oh, nice. Perfectly it's worded. It's an child. answer in search of technology. Oh, I'm gonna tell the organ I'm gonna tell the folks who write the brochures. <laughs> <laughs> Sign Chuck Sign Nice. Chuck nice. Oh, oh, is that a famous astrophysics? <laughs> <laughs> if you only knew. <laughs> mm. All right. Hey Brian, yeah. man, that was a uh, a very good question. Thank you for chiming in, my friend. Okay, this is Arthur Colombo Duarte. Duarte. Okay. Here's his question. And by the way, you'll like this. Uh, Arthur uh, says, cheers from Brazil. So he's writing this from Brazil. 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 But he does not tell us where. Just, mm -hmm. you know, it's a big place. Anyway, he says, uh, what do we know about the great attractor? And what are your thoughts on what it is or could be? Could it be some sort of dark matter planet? Mm. Interesting. So these people are doing their homework before yeah, they're, they're writing these questions. They really are. Man. Okay, so a couple, a couple of decades ago, it mm. might have been in the late '80s. Okay, uh, there in the research of where all the galaxies are going, uh, there was a research paper that noticed that there's an entire community of galaxies that are all headed towards one spot. Okay, in space, and then you look in that spot in space, and there's not an obvious thing to be tugging on them. Gotcha. And so it became to be known as the Great Attractor. And uh, you expect things to be moving because uh, we're near each other, we'll feel each other's gravity. Uh, we call the, uh, those are called peculiar velocities, it turns out, not because there's anything peculiar about them. Okay. It's just if you're moving within the fabric of space, that is a very natural speed that you would have. So we found this something called the Great Attractor. That's what it got called, and it got a lot of press in its day. Now, I haven't read up on the latest on that, mm -hmm. but we know that there's dark matter everywhere, and dark matter has gravity, just like ordinary matter, right. and there is six times as much of it. So we're no longer as shocked when we see things being drawn to one part of the universe or another. Right. Just because we don't see... Anything there. Or anything there, right. fully lit galaxies or right. anything. Because and we know that that happens... Kind yeah, of you can have now. now. Can it be a dark matter planet? Not likely. I'll tell you why. Okay. Because to make a planet, matter whatever it is that makes the planet has to be able to stick to itself. Gotcha. Think about that. Right. 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 What we, what, all right. the molecules of the rocks, they're stuck to one another. Right. All right. Dark matter not only doesn't stick to our kind of matter, it doesn't even stick to itself. Okay. So it's not obvious how you would ever coalesce dark matter into any kind of solid object at all. Gotcha. It would just pass through itself. It would pass through itself. Yeah, yeah. So it's not gonna it's not gonna get together and and hang out. And, and be the and, evil and, other planet. Exactly. <laughs> the dark exactly. The, right. Is there a dark matter earth <laughs> where where you have a goatee? Oh wait, you have a goatee now. <laughs> so my dark matter earth is a good shot. <laughs> mm, interesting. Yeah. That's very cool. So mm -hmm. it's like it's like uh what's it called here on Earth and uh, there's a place in the ocean where all the floating pollution tends oh, to gravitate. I just read about that. And it just comes into this giant trash circle. To grab mat and plastic bag. And it's just a big, <laughs> massive, um, you know, swirl of plastic garbage. Okay, that has nothing to do with dark matter in the universe, but it's still interesting that that happens at all. Yeah, but I'm saying, like, this is like that for oh, space. Oh, oh, so that's a that's an attractor. The attractor. Of, of itself. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. Even though, even mm -hmm. though yeah. Mm -hmm. Even though that's really just ocean currents coming together. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know, confluence. Deadpooling at one little place. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. to let us know that we're a bunch of a holes who <laughs> are polluting our world. Right? Yeah. That's very cool. So, mm -hmm. no dark matter planet, extremely, extremely unlikely. Right. Okay. Because based on everything we've based measured, on everything about, we know. Yeah, about dark matter. Because right. it passed through itself, nothing to stick to. Right. It's got to stick to itself, and then you can make solid objects. Yeah. But the attractor itself, completely understandable, because we know now. Yes, that dark matter has matters. gravity, just like regular matter. There you go. That's how we know it's there. Hey, Arthur, man, another great question. Mm -hmm. People are really living up to the uh, potpourri. Potpourri, <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> this is Mary Blick, Blickhan, Blickhan. Okay, uh, Mary doesn't tell me where she's coming from. Mm -hmm. Mary says, "I want to know more about the comment Ison." Oh. Mm -hmm. How close did it get to the sun, and how did it survive its trek? I guess it might, but I confess I just had a hunch. <laughs> I guess I guessed it might, 
but I confess I had a hunch. In other words, she, she knew it would survive. Uh, but comets have been around a long time and seem to survive anything. Oh, that is so not the case. Yeah. Comet Ison was a comet discovered a couple of years ago, and it was going. To, it was heralded as the great Christmas comet. It was a comet that was on the back on the on the back end as it neared. It comes around the other side of the sun. Just to remind ourselves, comets have very elongated orbits. Right. They spend a lot of time far away from the sun and a little bit of time very close to the sun. Mm -hmm. These are strongly elliptical orbits. That's why we don't see them all the time. Right. We only see them when they visit. Right. They, they pay the inner solar system a visit. Right. All right. Comet Ison. If you plotted its trajectory, it would come extremely close to the sun. I don't remember exactly how close, but close like within. A sun's own diameter. What? Of it. Yes. Wow. Yes. 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 That's actually yes. very, very close. Yes. 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 So. Okay. So now. Okay. So. And 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 the sun is. Big ball of plasma and hot. Hot. <laughs> and a comet is. Ice and cold. Cold. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and you were looking at me like, hey, you don't get these two right. You're not coming back. <laughs> After all this time here, Chuck. <laughs> if you don't get these two. It's curtains for you, The sun is hot, a comet is cold, and now you want to bring the comet within one solar diameter, diameter. of itself. This this, uh, uh, this does not bode well yes. for the comet. Exactly. So, Guess who's coming to dinner? <laughs> if the comet had survived the other side, right. it would have come out with a beautiful long tail because the sun evaporates. It actually sublimes the frozen get the frozen ice, the ices, turns them into gases. And on the other side was Thanksgiving and Christmas. And it would have been a beautiful comet, and people were touting it and talking it up, and and but nope, no, <laughs> the sun tore a new one in that comet. Had its way. The sun tore a new one. There are images of this. The comet's going in with all perfectly shaped tail. Hey and, everybody, I'm Rebecca. I'm Ison. <laughs> I'm coming. <with> us. <laughs> and Ison is an acronym for International. Uh, observation network or something. Okay. It's, it's an acronym. Forgive me, I don't have it off the top of my head. That's okay. But okay. Uh, it came out the other side and it was a raggedy looking thing. Aww. The thing broke apart, it diffused, and just completely disappeared on the other side. Wow. Well, well the glowing part. There probably debris there, but no longer was there a comet for us to embrace. That is awesome. Oh, man. Yeah, so, yeah, the sun tore a new one. That was the end of the comet. Then there was no... And that all happened, like, on Thanksgiving Day. All right, so, right. yeah, and there was no Christmas comment. So I saw and came in, and the son was like, this is my house. My, my house, you my can't. house. They don't do this to me in my house. <laughs> so every comet, no matter how close it comes, when a tail gets made, right. it's actually losing some of its own material. Of course, right. So comets have finite lifetimes. They, keep, they can't go around the sun forever. Right. So uh, yeah, so it doesn't make a difference which comet that. And so now eventually, eventually, com comet's going to die. And in fact, you've heard of, uh, you know, every night if you look hard long enough, you'll find a meteor, right, of course. A shooting star. Right. And occasionally there are meteor showers, right? right, which are always at the same time each year. You know what meteor showers are? Uh, that that is Earth plowing through the debris stream of long dead comets. Awesome. Whose trajectory crossed the orbit of the Earth. Oh, see, no. That is why they happen at the same time every year. Okay. And that's why they're a higher rate of these debris particles than in any other random night. So, Ison, I have to check which way its trajectory actually came. Right. Whether that will become a new meteor shower. Because to... we, we may one day actually uh, plow through the, the, the detritus rocky, the, of Ison. The rocky flotsam and jetsam of Ison. Sweet. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have to check if it's or it, it, the orbit has to be sort of near the plane of our orbit, and then it's a whole brand new meteor shower. So a meteor shower is basically a comet graveyard. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's awful. Yeah, yeah, it's the crap left over. <laughs> <laughs> After the sun done did its thing. Oh, yeah. wow, wow, that's right. a hey, great, great question. Mm -hmm. Another one. All right, let's uh, let's see if we can get one more in here mm -hmm. um, before the break. Yeah, yeah, before the break. Here we go. All right, here's a. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I'm gonna put this in here because this this is from Gerald. Gerald. And Gerald, this is a real question from Gerald. Okay. Go. This is what Gerald wants to know. Go. Uh, Chuck. Oh, he's asking you then. Okay, I can sit this one out. No. <laughs> I, it, How do you it, know you'd be asking me the question? I don't you know. I, I ask a lot of questions to you, so maybe, okay. All you right. Know. Go on. Uh, is Neil jacked, 
or are his shins just really tight? <laughs> My shins? Well, you know, like you, 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 there are pictures where you have like, you know, like oh. you look like you're, your shirts, I'm sorry. Your shirts, did I say oh, shins? I <laughs> okay, uh, let me do it again. All right, okay. give me back to two minutes. Two minute warning. Get back to two minutes. Okay. I said shins? Yes. Oh, God. Did we, teach, did we teach him how to read before he came on the show? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here yeah. we go. All right. So this is from Gerald. Gerald. Gerald is a real person. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask this. Uh, but it says, Chuck, is Neil jacked or are his shirts just really tight? <laughs> <laughs> well, first, uh, I know. In my day... Yeah, I was jacked. Yeah, I was the like captain of my wrestling team. Oh wow, 190 pounds. Wow, you yeah. were jacked. Oh yeah, I could I, I could totally kick some ass. All right, oh, I, right. I wanted to be protector of the nerd set. That's what I thought. You know what? That <laughs> makes sense. When no, you think that, that was my superhero dream. Right. The, the big back then, you know, the 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 tough quarterbacks would be shoving nerds into the locker rooms. And then before, you would show up? Before they would later learn that you needed the nerds to fix your computer. Right. right. So, <laughs> and before, before they were respected and revered. And then revered and became the richest people in the world. Right. In the day, when people were nerd hunting, I was card-carrying nerd, and I wanted to be the protector of all the nerds of the world in my own little superhero fantasy. So, that's, that's, yeah. a, that's a noble fantasy. So there'd be like a little bat signal that would go up in the sky, and I would land. What would I, it be, a pocket protector? I don't know. <laughs> They okay. shine a pocket protector. Later in the day, it would be like a slide rule. And right. however extended the slide rule was, that's how, that's how serious the encounter was necessary. Yeah, so no, I, 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 and I study martial arts, and so I was, uh, in my day. Right. So, so somewhere below some layers of fat, a few of those muscles, I think, might still be there. There's some muscle memory maybe a Muscle memory? <laughs> I'm trying to, I asked the trainer, I said, so when am I going to get my six-pack? He said, it's still there. It's just under the fat. Right. So I, I was jacked of like 40 pounds ago. And I, if I take it off, I plan to take some off by the end of this year. Okay. Um, maybe we'll, you know, we'll see if any, we'll any see of it it's... remains. Okay. <laughs> All right, there you go, Gerald. Yeah. There's, a, there's your answer. Yeah. Well, wait, wait. If you saw the, the shirts recently, yeah, I could still fill a shirt. But but you generally I'm sitting at a table and you'll see my belly hanging <laughs> upper below. <laughs> you see my upper body, not my midsection. All right, I'm gonna leave this alone. <laughs> I got a, I've got a fully respectable middle aged man belly that I'm quite proud of. All right. All right, so uh, Chuck, uh, we'll come back for the next segment. Yes, and uh, you'll be here. Don't run away. I will not. And you're listening to Star Talk. We're back on Star Talk. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson. Chuck Nice sitting across from me. Yes, I am. Chuck, you 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 tweet Chuck Nice comic. That is correct. At Chuck Nice comic. I like your. I like when there's a an event going on, uh, either the Oscars or the Super Bowl. And yes. you, you just bar. You throwing up barbs. Yeah, I do, man. I, you like you're like ninja stars. Throwing up. <laughs> Take that. Take that. You know that's the only way I can get through those. Uh, I don't think Katy those... Perry survived. You no. know? <laughs> I love it during the Super Bowl yeah. halftime. Yeah. All right. So, uh, we are in uh, Cosmic Queries. Yes, we are. Right, but Star Talk, the Cosmic Queries edition, is the way I call it. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, so what do you have? So, we've got questions from all across the internet. So I have, and I haven't seen them. You have time. not mm -hmm. seen them. Mm -hmm. And um, so, let's get back to uh, our, our, uh, mm -hmm. our questions. And this one is from Jersey Norrington. Jersey Norrington. <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> Sounds like uh, sounds like an anchor. No, it sounds like, or a porn name. Or a porn, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Jersey Norrington. Or yeah. an anchor porn man. Anchor porn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Jersey Norrington. Your top story. Wow, wow, wow. Okay. Um. <laughs> that was like so 1978. I know. Porn music track. <laughs> yeah. Yes. All yes. right. What do you have? All right. Here we go. Uh, why is it that no one talks about ITER, and this is what he puts, I-T-E-R, I never heard of it, uh, so maybe he's right. <laughs> maybe he's right. right. Um, they're trying to get a fusion reactor uh, to work, so it could create an infinite source of energy. I really think that's cool. Hmm. All right, so ITER, let me to remember what that stands for, International Thermonuclear Experimental. 
does the R stand for? I don't remember. Reactor. But reactor, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll reactor. take it. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take fusion I'll reactor. Take it. <laughs> uh, and so uh, you can have fusion. Right. A uh, fusion is the bringing together of small atoms. Right. To make a bigger atom. It turns out when you do that, you get energy. Okay. Up to a point. But you get energy. Bring two hydrogen atoms, make helium, you get energy. Mm. The sun does that every second of its life. Sweet. And it is very efficient. Uh, it really is. It's just, just back up. When, okay. Turn it along. That is, so it takes high temperature. Okay. And you're fusing nuclei. So thermonuclear fusion. Gotcha. That is what that's called. Thermonuclear fusion. Now, we have mastered thermonuclear fusion ever since, like, the, the 50s. The, okay. The late 40s, early 50s. It's called a bomb. Right, I was going to say. <laughs> what we have not mastered is the control of thermonuclear fusion. Right. All right? Uncontrolled thermonuclear fusion is called a bomb. Not a socket. No, that, was, that would be... Oh, no, because uh, that, that was a hydrogen that was bomb. A, no, that was an atomic bomb. Atomic using, bomb. Using... And Nagasaki used... Uh, your uh, That one used plutonium. Plutonium. So yeah. where's the hydrogen bomb? The hydrogen bomb has never been used in warfare. Oh. But those pictures you see with yeah, like with tiny big... little ships next to the whole, and half the ocean is yes. blown out of, <laughs> those are hydrogen bombs. Oh my God. Hydrogen bombs make atom bombs look like, like starter firecrackers. Oh yeah. Oh, there's no contest between the two. The two of them. Huh? Oh yeah. When we talk about nuclear power, we're really talking about who's, you know, who's got, uh, well, no. You... Okay. Uh, if your start, the starter kit is to make, <laughs> Is to make a nuclear fission bomb, and that's what happened in the Second World War. Okay, but so that's you, a nuclear fission bomb. Because you take big atoms, make them little, and you get energy by doing right, that too. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So then the atomic bomb. That is big atoms in the, in, in the very specific cases of the Second World War, splitting uranium and splitting, splitting plutonium. Okay. An element named after the cosmic object Pluto, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uranium was named after the planet Uranus. And guess what Neptunium was named after? Oh, the god of the sea? <laughs> Neptune. <laughs> so we have three consecutive elements on the periodic table. Uranium, Neptunium, Plutonium. Gotcha. Named after Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. But since Pluto's not a planet anymore, I think it got it got on the periodic table on false pretense. Just between you and me. Uh, we'll get it started. Okay, so now what are they going to call him on the periodic chart? Neil killed me? <laughs> <laughs> Dwarf Plutonium. Right so, so... Dwarf Tonium. Dwarf Tonium. There you go. I love it. So... All right, so... Getting back, back to, 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 uh, to fu fusion, yes. thermal nuclear fusion. So in France, there is a there is a collaborative project, international project, to try to harness fusion, because if you did it and harness it in the way the sun does it in a controlled way, you have essentially an unlimited uh, supply of energy. Of course, yes. and and as they say, too cheap to bill. Personally, I think. Our electricity is already too cheap to bill. You know why? Why? Of course, you do get an electric bill, but you know why it's too cheap to bill? Why? If you're driving away from your home and you see you left your living room light on, are you going to stop the car, get out, go unlock the door, go in and turn out the light? No, no you're not. That light is staying on until you get home That's today. Right. Even if you're a conservationist. Even if you're a You say, no, I'm no. not. I'm a... That's why I got the old uh, in, in, uh, fluorescent light bulbs. Okay. That's so why I got fluorescent light that, bulbs. So already, we tr it, certainly in America, we treat, in the United States, we treat electricity like it is the least of our financial right. priorities, given how we use it. Uh, so fully lit up malls at night when nobody's there. For example. Fully lit up buildings. Built, light up cities when everybody's going home. Oh, everybody's going home and it's asleep. So, so, uh, so this, uh, why is anyone talking about it? Well, we haven't achieved it yet the day it's achieved it's going to be headlines all over the place right yeah now do you think it's achievable because i mean that's yeah, it's, real... in principle yeah you have to control plasma here's the problem the 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 temperature of the stuff you need to it has to be high temperature to, right. to fuse the, the yeah. nuclei together i was gonna say the, you're, you're basically talking about having the sun here on earth exactly and it and it's so hot you say okay oh uh, how what vessel are you going to put it in and carry it from one place to another <laughs> Here, take this 10 million degree plasma right. and, and, and go straight home with it. Don't, don't go anywhere else. Right. And so their plasma is actually uh, magnetically responsive. So there are things where you can create a magnetic cavity where it's uh, kind of like a magnetic bottle, right. if you will. And then it sort of bounces off the magnetic field that contains it. Kind of like the radiation from the sun does... On the Earth. Well, uh, it sees the magnetic field and then so reads around it. It's precisely the same phenomenon going on. Oh, okay. But if you design a magnetic bottle intelligently, then maybe you can have it serve your energy needs by having fusion with it. Fusion within it. Oh, gotcha. Uh, so, so yeah. Oh my uh, God, let me tell you something. Uh, listen, and and 
I'm just the person who gets very nervous. And Jersey, uh, Jersey, all I can say, man, is this sounds... Jer Jersey Wellington? What's Jersey it? Norrington. Norrington, yes, yes. Uh -huh. Anchor porn man. <laughs> yes. Uh, it sounds really dangerous. Well, uh, I mean, like, if what you're talking about, if let's say you have this magnetic bomb mm -hmm. and the containment field fails, Ooh. you are wiping out, like, I don't know what, yeah. like, for I don't know how many miles around so, you. So you design, that, you design it so it doesn't fail. Okay, next question. <laughs> Duh. We, we have so solved this problem. <laughs> That's why you need really good engineers oh, in this world. There you yeah. go, man. Okay. All right. All right what else you got? Okay, here we go. Let's move on to <clears throat> uh, Ersch von Gergonsver. Von Gergonsver. Yeah, keep telling yourself that, Chuck. Okay, go on. <laughs> I'm so glad you're not president of a university who's reading the names of the diplomas. Oh, man. That, <laughs> and I'd be like, and next guy? <laughs> next guy? <laughs> Please come up and get your diploma. <laughs> next guy? <laughs> and young lady? <laughs> Please come up and get your diploma, young lady. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. All right, <laughs> All right here, uh, dear Dr. Tyson. Okay. I love when you talk about the validity of science in movies. One thing that always defies my suspension of disbelief in sci-fi movies is when the character is briefly exposed to space to go between airlocks without some sort of space pressure suit. This happens in both Sunshine and Event Horizon. Is this even remotely possible? Thanks for entertaining me on my commute. Ooh. Hey, Earth, that was cool. Very nice. Very nice okay, Earth. So, uh, here's the problem when you change the, the the pressure that your body is immersed in. Okay. And we learned this, I, I think, for the first time, building the Brooklyn Bridge. Oh, really? Yeah. And building the Brooklyn Bridge, a lot of that structure is deep underwater. Yeah. And so you... The East River. So you have these things called caissons, I think they're called. And these are basically huge bubbles. It's just a, 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 a... If you have a... I don't know. Take like a pot. Okay. All right, and then invert it, and then submerge the pot. Right. You've you've trapped air in there. Yes, you did. So you, so if you have little chairs inside that pot, make the pot big enough so you can sit in it inverted, and then you submerge the entire pot, and now you can breathe the air while you're underwater. Okay. But the deeper you go under the water, the higher is the pressure pushing up against that air right. from the water that's at your feet. Okay. The higher is that pressure, and that can have an effect on your physiology. Right. All right. And this, when they did this to build the Brooklyn Bridge, they discovered this new physiological failure called the bends. Uh -huh. And what happens is you can go down there, uh -huh. that's fine, but it's coming back. Gases that are dissolved in your circulatory system, right. when your body is then exposed to lesser pressure, begin to escape from you. Okay. And... Uh, the gases in your lungs, as they expand, you can just exhale that. Right. That's cool. Okay. But suppose the gas is dissolved in your bloodstream. All of a sudden, these pockets of air right. show up inside your bloodstream. That's not good. That's, that's not good. <laughs> Thanks for concluding that. <laughs> that's not good. That's not good. So you have to be very careful when you change from one pressure to the other. You have to do it slowly right. or um, non-catastrophically. All right, so if you go from one atmospheric pressure into zero atmospheric pressure, space, right? Um, you're subject to these things that could end up giving you the bends. But if, you, if you're not there for very long, generally you're not there longer than you can breathe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? Right. How long are you in the airlock? For, for a half hour? No. no. You're in the airlock... Without a suit on, because that was some emergency maneuver you had to do, you're not going to be there longer than you can hold your breath. Correct. All right. So, uh, all yeah, you might get some of the case of the bends, but it's not going to kill you. Your eyes are not going to pop out. Okay. You know why your eyes are not going to pop out? Because there's not an air yeah. pop. There's not an air pocket behind them ready to po pop out your eyes. We're, the, we're liquid. Right. Right. So when liquid changes pressure, it's all about what are the gases doing within them. Okay. Okay. Now, you want an example of gases coming out of liquid? Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, do tell. Do that. Okay. Believe me, because I can think of a few. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> that's, that's when you go into, I'm eight years old brain. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, so uh, the, what, the best example is a, 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 a sealed can of soda. 
Okay, it's right. under pressure. It's under pressure, right? right. And and uh, let's say let's take a bottle so you can look in it. It's under pressure. You don't see any bubbles anywhere. Right. Pop the lid. All the bubbles escape. Exactly. They were dissolved there until the pressure changed. Exactly. And so it's whatever is the atm above atmospheric pressure in it, and then it goes down to atmospheric pressure. The bubbles escape. So so, so, so you have to be careful, and right. and it won't be comfortable. But just get the hell out of there. Uh, so now, okay, if I'm in the airlock and the in in the event horizon, this ship. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. They depressurize. Yeah. I'm in it. Yeah, you got some. You've got it. You've got. But a... all I have now is, I held my breath. Yes. The airlock opens. Uh huh. And now, just across, I can push off and get into another airlock, repressurize. Could I do that? Yes. Easily. Oh, okay. Easily. Okay. If you have your wits about you. If you have your wits about you. You could be. Ah. No. That, Which is now. Now that's my home movie. <laughs> you. You ain't making it. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the real movie right there. That's the. That's yeah. how people would actually. Right. Breathe. It's just like the airlock opens up, just like. Ah. No, but no. you couldn't hear because I'm in space. Exactly. <laughs> because in space, no one can hear you scream in an airlock without air. <laughs> exactly. It would be silent movie. That'd be funny. Right. But <laughs> the camera picks up. The, the, the what's silent scream. <laughs> and yes, that's super cool. This is something they did accurately in the movie Gravity. Okay. The sound level, as they went in and out of airlocks, would go from complete dead to slowly you begin to hear it, and then it was a full-up volume sound. They did right. it brilliantly oh, okay. in the movie Gravity. Yes. So that's so there. You, listen there, Ursh. Uh, yeah. That's a great answer, man. That was very very cool. It's all about the gas, baby. Yeah. <laughs> and and in the movie, um, one of the Mars movies, uh, which one? The one that had uh, name one of the Mars, but Mission Red, Red Planet. Um, uh, it was either Red Planet or Mission to Mars. I think it was Mission to Mars. Okay. Uh, where. Uh, the tether doesn't reach him, and he doesn't want them to come after him. So he, uh, d he, he, so he kills himself right. so that they don't come after him. You know how he kills himself? He lifts so off the visor. Thing, yeah. And, okay. And three seconds later, he looks like he's been dead for twenty years. Right. No, that doesn't. Happen. No, you would see him suffocating there. Uh, right. That's how really it would happen. Yes. Or or total recall. Where Arnold Schwarzenegger doesn't have his helmet on, uh -huh. and his eyes begin to bulge out of his head like one of those little squeeze toys. <laughs> I've seen those. Yes, yeah. and uh, the pressure so, relieving, you know, the, the stress relieving, yeah, the stress relieving squeeze, squeeze toy, uh -huh. and that's what his eyes do. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> and then all of a sudden he comes. That great. That, that, that wasn't even a sentence, but you knew it could only be uttered by Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> So you Shut, how did you pull that off? How, well, you know that's that brilliant. Yeah, that's that's like every comics like every comic does Arnold's the <laughs> and that's all you have to do to do Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so that's not true then. That that's the no. You could survive a couple of minutes for yes. a couple of minutes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. Just don't stay there long. <laughs> that's all. Gotcha. 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 If our circulatory system were entirely gas. Right. And then you stepped out into an extremely low pressure environment, yeah, you'd, you'd explode. Like a balloon. Yeah, like a balloon. You'd right. explode, but we're liquid, and so liquid has different reactions. So there's different properties for liquid, and Correct. the fact that we're 70% of that, boom. Right. No, okay. no we're 100%. 100 oh, yeah. No, you're 70% water. That's what I mean. Yes. 70% water. Yeah, but, the, right. Yeah. But yeah. bone is liquid? You could, is bone considered liquid in your body? Sure. <laughs> no, I'm serious. <laughs> God, we're Did you just ask that question? Is bone liquid? Well, Did that right. question just come out of your mouth? Yeah, because you said we're all liquid. We got to go to commercial so I can slap you upside your head. Oh, man. And see, then bring you back. That just shows how much I trust you, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to Star Talk Radio. Cosmic Queries Edition. Potpourri. We'll be right back. <laughs> we are back. Star Talk Radio. Neil deGrasse Tyson here. Your personal astrophysicist. Chuck, nice. Yes, sir. Sitting across from me. Yes, I am. Chuck, uh, I, I bitch slapped you over the commercial break. Yes. For yes. asking, are our bones liquid? Well, no. <laughs> Don't say no. I, I know no. bones are not liquid. What I was saying is, like, <laughs> I, I thought maybe there was some way that you considered them to be a liquid because, you know, you have marrow in a bone, which is kind of gelatinous, you know what I mean? It's not completely solid. I don't know. That sounds like a complete, like, try to make up for that. <laughs> so, no, so, so what the real question is, if you took all the liquid out of a human body, how much weight remains in, in, in calcium in the bones or whatever? Muscle fibers, whatever. I don't, I don't know what that number is. But okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. That's like all. you know. All right. Cool. We're cool. Uh, just before we begin, this just came across my desk. Yes. Here. 
just in. A couple people submitted geek pickup lines. Right. And, but I, I, they're kind of lame. I'll, I'll read them. Okay. But they're kind of lame, but I'm wondering, maybe we should actually have an actual contest. I like the idea. And then we get to read, if you, and we pick the best ones and read them on the air. Have, All like, right. Devote a whole show <laughs> to geek. <laughs> or, or at least a segment. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, whole show, that's a very ambitious. That's ambitious. Okay, <laughs> here goes one. I, I'll do my best Barry White impression okay. here. Are you the square root of negative one? Because you can't be real. Oh, God. <laughs> actually, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. <laughs> that's actually not too bad. But you gotta like be, you gotta remember right. your like imaginary numbers, it's a square root of negative one. Here's one. Um, no, this is t totally like calculus geek. Uh, I wish I was your derivative, so I could, I wish I was your derivative. So I can lie tangent to your curves. <laughs> <laughs> that's like calculus. Calculus, you're finding the slope of a line. Yeah, exactly. That's what the derivative is. And so you, you take the, the first derivative of a curve, and right. you, like, you lay it right, right there. Right and there. It comes across that it's little right point. There. And uh, right there. I got one more here, go and then you we go back to our potpourri. Our love is like dividing by zero. You cannot define it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. I gotta tell you, using those lines, you better build a robot girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's one. Uh, hey, baby, are you a graviton? Because I find myself attracted to you. <laughs> <That's ridiculous. laughs> totally geeked out. Totally. Well, I bet, I bet our yeah, our listeners could totally beat these. And so we, we got to figure out how to announce the contest. Yeah. We'll do it on our website. We'll figure it out. Yeah. And we'll do a whole show, if not only part of a show. Yeah. On, on, all and right. Let some people get in there. That's get pretty in there. cool. They'll probably be better than that. All right. So what do you have? All right. Let's get back to our Cosmic Queries potpourri. Potpourri edition. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's see what Jim Scarborough wants to know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Jim says, what is this conservation of information Dembski puts forth? Why do I keep forgetting things? <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is good. Are you that's are, a great question. Is it really? Yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> information in, in the in the middle 20th century and onward, mm -hmm. people uh, the whole branch of uh, research opened up called information theory. True. Right. If something has information. How long will it retain that information? And if it doesn't have the information, where did the information go? Okay. Information is very different from things like conservation of mass or energy or mass energy. For example, if you have an orange and then I give you a second orange, you have twice as much orange, don't you? I hope so. Okay. If I give you a newspaper, then I give you that identical newspaper, you do not have twice as much information. That is true. You have the same amount of information but duplicated. I, but I do have a bathroom for my dog. <laughs> okay. Now I do. I hope it's a puppy. That's what you're doing with your dog. <laughs> it's true. Otherwise, it's an infirmed dog. <laughs> so information theory behaves differently from other kind. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, conservation of information is a different understanding uh, and a different treatment of information than conservation of mass energy. Uh, would be treated. That, that's all. And so th there's an idea that uh, it, can you lose information? What happens to it? And he's saying if there's a conservation of information theorem, then why is it that he forgets stuff? That's, right? <laughs> no, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant question. Um, what what happens is what you remembered or thought you remembered becomes other things, typically okay. in your brain. Right. It just becomes other things. And so, so it's still there. It's just not. It's not the same. It's, it's not the same information. It's the same information. It's a total amount of information. Uh, yeah, it's it's an amount of information that you mm -hmm. might be conserving there. But uh, it's not my research specialty, so I don't know what the latest is that they're all saying about it. Right. It seems to me that if I have a newspaper and I burn it, I got rid of all that information. <laughs> True. And this is what happens in book burnings. Uh, civilizations t typically take a few steps back. Mm -hmm. Because they've lost. And when you say civilization, you mean Republicans. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, no, you don't. I do. You don't. I do. You don't. Well, Jim, there you have it. There is a, There really is a con conservation of information. And oh, by uh, the way, e uh, everyone who passed the Jim Crow laws were Democrats. 
This is true. Just as a reminder. We, the yes. Southern Democrats, we all know, are now modern day Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you just can't generalize over time and space. Uh, I'll give you that. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> all right, Jim. Great question. And uh, your answer is early onset Alzheimer's. Okay. So. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's uh, let's move on. Let's uh, okay. I want to see here. What? I... Wow, wow. Okay, real simple. But uh... can we join in in this wow? Okay, yeah. Sit there and admire the question and leave us leave us hanging. Okay, this is Jacob Seymour, and Jacob wants to know: Does nuclear fusion occur at the bottom of black holes? Ooh. Yeah, man. That's Ooh. why I was like, wow. Ooh. Wow. Really simple, but good question. Ooh. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, plaus it's plausible. Okay. Because the, at, at the singularity, which is like the limits of Einstein's equations, where in fact you are literally dividing by zero. Right. Uh, which means we don't have a theory to understand the singularity. Okay. We can just say, oh, that's, well, the, that's the best we got. <laughs> Come up with something better. <laughs> right at that singularity. Right. At that point, all matter is at a very dense state. But we do know that the energy created by nuclear fusion. Right. Even if it occurred at the singularity, would not be enough to do a damn thing to the black hole. Wow! Yes, black holes are stronger than any nuclear fusion that would occur within them. So you can run the, you can run that. It's why we got the black hole in the first place. Exactly. The black hole used to be a star. Right. And the star was going to explode, and it didn't. The right. black hole said, "No, you're not." <laughs> <laughs> so, so as the mass of stars, the higher the mass star, the difference, the, their fate becomes more and more different from what the sun would be. There's a point where a star dies as an explosion, a supernova. If it's more massive than that, it wants to become a supernova, but the gravity overcomes that, and it's black hole gravity, and the whole star collapses down uh, and implodes within itself. And so, no, you, you can't... Every time I try to get out, they keep pulling me back in! That is what everyone is saying who's stuck in a black hole right now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Wow. With, with that level of frustration, I might have. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure, probably. I'm so sure. Wow, that was fascinating. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff there. All right, let's go with uh, Douglas Na Napolitano. And Douglas says... Wait, you pronounce his name in a Spanish way, but it's clearly Italian. Uh, Napolitano. Napolitano. Oh, come on now. <laughs> Napolitano. Napolitano. Mm -hmm. Okay. Douglas wants to know this. It's like he's from Italy. I mean, from, from, Naples. from Naples. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Douglas wants to know this. Was there space before the Big Bang, or was space created during the Big Bang? What is the universe expanding into? In other words, is space expanding with the matter and energy, or is the matter and energy expanding in the space? Man, my head, man. My boy my got head. some cosmic angst yeah, going a, on. He ain't getting to sleep, yo, you he, know? <laughs> I gotta tell you, it's, it's, it's a nice little, uh... <laughs> conundrum that he's yeah so everything that we've come to know and define space to be was formed within the big bang okay and if we have a multiverse or some prior existing state out of which our universe spawned mm -hmm. that would be embedded in higher dimensions and so normal space is not how you would address that um, that configuration It'd be higher dimensional space a four dimensional space five or ten dimensions it's some higher dimensional space in which that occurs gotcha. so uh, we are so, if space is where there's nothing, then outside of space, you might call that nothing, nothing. Nothing, nothing. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> so, we have top people working on the nothing, nothing. Gotcha, gotcha. So, yeah. Chuck, uh, Chuck, we are in the five-minute warning zone. Uh -oh. This means, you know what that means. That's right. The lightning round. It's the lightning round. Okay, I will answer questions in soundbite mode. Okay. To get in as many as we can in the next four minutes. All right, here we go. go. This, this one from Facebook and Paul Bear. Paul Bear wants to know, how is the gravity of the sun strong enough to hold Jupiter into place, but not strong enough to pull the Earth close enough to eat it up? Oh, because Earth is moving faster than Jupiter. And at our speed, at our distance, we are in a safe orbit. If we were moving at the speed of Jupiter, at our speed, at our distance right now, we would fall into the, into the sun. Boom! Bada bing! Boom! Bada, oh, oh yeah. There, okay. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Right, next. next. All right. right, so every orbit, at every distance from the sun, there is one speed right. that you can sustain and maintain that orbit. Anything less, you fall into the sun. Anything more, you will go to a high, high you'll go to a higher orbit. Okay, go. rogue go. planet. Go. All right, here we go. Uh, also from Facebook, Patrick Clark wants to know this. Dr. Tyson, what do you see as the advantages, benefits of permanent human 
colonization of other bodies in the solar system? What resources do places like the moon and NEAs hold? And how could we harness and use them efficiently? Oh, so uh, NASA has a whole new branch of itself called uh, I, uh, ISRU, okay. in situ resource utilization which is NASA speak for, when you get there, find your own damn food. <laughs> Build. <laughs> damn, man, that's yeah. rough. So you got to look ahead. See, is there water there? Is there natural resources? Can you can you seed the soils in a way to grow plant life? Is there enough sunlight? So right now, there's nothing like Earth out there. And right. so if you're going to go, you're going to have to bring a whole lot of Cheetos for something to keep you, keep you <laughs> fed. Until you can... So uh, the resource... We develop... Our species exists on Earth thriving on resources resources that are native to Earth. Right. That's why we are okay here. Right. And and not okay on the moon or on Mars. So this is a huge challenge. There you go. That we have not yet resolved. Go. Next. All right. There you have yes. it. The answer is click your heels, Patrick. There's no place like home. Nice. All right. Uh, let's see That here. might mean Patrick is wearing ruby slippers. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Amanda Dean wants uh -huh. to know this. Uh, why are some planets in gas form and some in solid? Does this differ in a binary star system? Ooh, turns out, uh, would you say Earth is gaseous? No, no, because it's mostly rock, and then we have this thin layer of atmosphere on it. Jupiter, if you go deep enough, it has a solid middle. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody's got a solid so, core. So basically, we're all the same. It's just more atmosphere. More atmosphere, and in Jupiter's case, most of its mass is in the form of gas. I got a fever, and I need more atmosphere. <laughs> Fantastic. Ah, more cowbell. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. More atmosphere. All right, here's the next All question. Right. This is from G. Oh, by the way, Jupiter has a much higher gravity, so it can hold the very light gases, such as uh, hydrogen and helium, that we could not hold. Right. Jupiter is mostly hydrogen and helium. Very light gases, very fast-moving atoms. They can fly out of a weak gravity field, as they did for us. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So our atmosphere is denser, heavier than... Jupiter's atmosphere. We have heavier molecules in our atmosphere. Oh, okay. Because they don't move as fast. And so, so, they so you don't sound escape. like a chipmunk on Jupiter. On Jupiter. Yes, you so would. Yes. I, awesome. I never thought that through because I wouldn't. I was not going to think I would get out of my spaceship and open my helmet <laughs> while I was in the atmosphere of Jupiter. But since you've already thought this through, Chuck, <laughs> that is exactly how it would happen. Time for one more question. Go. <laughs> Go. Maybe chill. So all, all the Jupiterians <laughs> are, are sound like Mickey Mouse. Go. Go. The native Jupiterians. Go. All right. Here we go. This is from Paul F. Uh, Paul F. Aaron Franz, uh, Aaron Fsky Jr., okay. How can we tell what far off planets and the other objects are made of? Ooh! Yeah! This was the birth of modern astrophysics in the late 19th century. We took the spectroscope, the prism, take light, move it through the prism, out the other side, it breaks it up into a component colors, and it, um, like a rainbow, right. and in there you find embedded the fingerprints of the very chemical identity of what it is you are looking at. Boom! Bada bing! And so today, we don't just look at pretty pictures of the night sky, as Hubble would have you believe, looking at the greatest hits from that telescope. What we do is we take the light, and we slice it, and we dice it, and in that light we find carbon, Nitrogen, oxygen, silicon, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. We find molecules, atoms, and that is how we decode the chemical nature of the universe. Chuck, we gotta go. <laughs> uh, thanks for being with me on another edition of Star Talk. This, the Cosmic Queries edition. My pleasure. Potpourri. Potpourri. You've been listening to Star Talk Radio. As always, I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist, bidding you to keep looking up. This is Star Talk.